chapter one. So chapter one is an introduction to operating system. So in this chapter, uh, some of the uh, some of the topics I will go through them quickly for two different reasons. They may be review material that uh, you should have seen in other courses. Or they could be material that we will be discussing in detail in the future. So review material belongs to the past. And material that we will be discussing in detail later belongs to the future. And in this, in covering chapter one, I will focus on the present. And the present is uh, you know, those topics that are not review topics and we will not be covering in detail later. So these are the topics that I will be focusing on. And I will not be getting to the first such topic until the last maybe five minutes of this lecture. So, uh, so first, the, you know, the definition of an operating system. What's an operating system? So we defined an operating system last time, and there are multiple ways of defining an operating system. One. Uh, definition is that it's an intermediary between the user and the computer hardware. The operating system executes programs and makes the computer convenient to use. It's convenient for the user and it makes it convenient for the application program because the application programmer can use many services that are provided by the operating system through system calls or APIs, <laughs> and we will be talking about system calls and APIs in greater detail in chapter two. Uh, but these system calls provide many services to the application programmers, so the application programmer can just make these calls instead of actually implementing these services. And in fact, in, in many cases, the application programmer is not allowed to uh, access uh, devices directly. Also, one of the important uh, uh, objectives of an operating system is managing hardware resources. So what are the different components of a computer system? Uh, you know, we have the hardware, and we have the operating system on top of the hardware, and we have the application programs uh, running on top of the operating system. You know, so the operating system here stands between the application programs and the computer hardware. Now, uh, so it, application programs run on top of the operating system and use the services provided by the operating system and the operating system manages access to computer hardware, to the hardware resources. So if multiple applications are requesting access to the same hardware resource, the operating system will manage that, will resolve this conflict in a good way. And of course, uh, the details of this will be learned later. It's in fact, it's basically most of this course is about learning how the operating system resolves these conflicts uh, among application programs when they request access to resources. Okay, so in this picture, it looks like uh, all of these application programs or all of these system and application programs use the operating system. So it's saying that the compiler uses the operating system, which is true, but there are, uh, in fact, this is not, uh, this is not always true. In, uh, in, uh, it's true that the compiler uses the operating system, but it's also true that the operating system uses the compiler. So it goes both ways. The relation between the compiler and the operating system goes both ways. So the question is, when does the operating system use the compiler? Yeah? When it needs to run a program? Mm, no, it's, uh, well, when it needs to run a program, well, if it's, uh, if we're talking about uh, a language like Java that has a, a just-in-time compiler, uh, yes, it, uh, but here, the operating system invokes the just-in-time compiler. It does not use it. It's not that the operating system itself needs the compiler. It's starting the just-in-time compiler uh, for that particular programming language. 
But when does the operating system need the compiler? Why would make, when does an application need a compiler? At when, it's, when it's installed, when it needs to compile a program. Yeah, when it's compiled, right? If it's, if it's written in a compiled language, the, the application is compiled by uh, the, the software vendor who makes the software. And if, it, you know, if, it's, if it's not an open source software, all what you get is the binary that the software vendor has uh, uh, generated using a compiler. Now the question is, what, in which language are operating systems written? C. C. Yeah, so, yeah, exactly. So uh, most operating systems are <coughs> mostly written in C and C++. So if, if the operating system itself is written in a high level language, the operating system itself needs a compiler to compile the operating system code. So the operating system does not need the, the compiler when it's running, but it needs the, uh, the people who make the operating system need a compiler to compile the operating system source code into machine code, right? And you know, what you get, what you load on the machine is the operating system machine code, right? That has been generated by a compiler. So basically, the operating system code, the operating system machine code, has been generated by a compiler. Oh, I just wanted to point this out as a as a compiler engineer. <coughs> just initially, right? It's not like an ongoing change. It's only to do that once. Yeah, yeah. it's not beginning. even initially. It's when it's being made. Like when you get Windows. Mm -hmm. Windows is a closed source operating system. So who compiles it? What Microsoft does. So what you get is the binary. You, you don't even you don't need a compiler on your machine. They need a compiler on their machine when they develop the operating system, and they just give you the binary, which is the machine code. Mm -hmm. So if right? you have like a CD with Microsoft Windows on it, yeah, it contains a binary. That's yeah, that's the binary. That's the executable. Mm -hmm. Right. But when you get an open source operating system like Linux, you get the actual source code of the operating system. And then uh, you, not you, the, um, usually it's the system administrator who compiles the operating system source code. If it's an open source operating system, <laughs> well, even if it's an operating source operating, even if it's an open source operating system, you may get the binary. But another option is getting the source code of the operating system and compiling it, doing the compilation yourself. Would you need a, an OS? Already on your computer to do that? Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you need you need an OS. You need you need a, a different operating system or a different version, an earlier version of the same operating system. The design of an operating system is gonna depend on the nature of the system that this operating system is going uh, to run on or is going to, to manage basically, because the operating system manages uh, the, the, the system. Now, you know, we have different kinds of systems. We have uh, mainframes or servers, we have workstations, we have handheld devices, and we have embedded devices. And each one of these has its own uh, specific, specific needs and requirements and uh, which reflect uh, on the operating system as design objectives. So, an operating system on a server has different design objectives. It has to uh, ensure <coughs> fairness among users. It has multiple users, and making all users happy is one important design objective of an operating system that runs on a server. But if it's an operating system that is running on a uh, mobile device, then that mobile device is gonna be used by one user, and uh, there are uh, other important issues when it comes to designing an operating system for a mobile device, issues such as making good use of the poor or limited resources on a mobile device, and uh, things like issues like uh, uh, the battery life. You would like to uh, minimize the usage of uh, energy, minimum energy, so that the battery can, uh, can serve for a longer time. So the point here is that you know different systems have different uh, objectives. Uh, embedded systems, for example, have their own uh, specific requirements 
Uh, what's an embedded system, by the way? It has very limited uh, so what user interface. But what is it? What is, what is an embedded system? Like a piece of hardware. <laughs> so all computer systems are pieces of hardware. So what's an embedded? What, what, what do we mean by embedded? Embedded where? It, yeah. It's a, a system that is made to help another piece of hardware function, such as a car or a fridge, but it's not itself like being used as a computer. Well, yeah, that's true, but uh, you don't need the last sentence. I mean, it's used as a computer, but it's an embedded computer. So it's not, you know, it's part of another system, like you said, a car, a refrigerator, washer, dryer, uh, uh, you know, medical device. Uh, we have computers everywhere. So those computers that uh, control other machines or devices uh, are called uh, embedded, uh, embedded systems. And obviously, you know, uh, uh, there are uh, they are everywhere. They are in every machine or device that, that we use these days. All machines and devices have, uh, very much all of them have uh, some kind of small computer that is embedded in them. And obviously in these computers, small embedded computers, uh, the requirements are different. So it's not, uh, you know, these are basically controlling the machine. They're not interacting with the user. So we do not have the notion of user interface. It's basically machine interface. They're interfacing with a machine and controlling a machine. So they have different a different nature and different requirements. So we can think of the operating system as a resource allocator or a resource manager that manages the resources and we can also think of it as a control program. You know, it's the manager and that manager uh, resolves conflicts and provides protection. A very uh, simple example of protection is memory protection. So. It's the job, and this is something that we will be studying in greater detail later, which is memory management. But we all know that uh, you know, the operating system has the job of allocating memory. So if I have processes, process number one, this oversimplifies things. It's just trying to explain the idea. Process number one has a certain uh, chunk of memory allocated to it. Process number two has a different uh, has a different uh, uh, chunk of memory allocated to it, and there is the operating system kernel. So what's the kernel? It's the main program of the operating system. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the, you can think of it as the main program or the, the central piece, <laughs> the essential piece of the, uh, the operating system. Uh, the kernel of the operating system that is always loaded in memory that may, as we will see later, again, may load other operating system uh, components or modules. Uh, okay, now protection. What if this uh, process number one attempts to access a memory location in process number two? Then this will definitely cause a problem, it, will, it may override some data or code in process number two, and what is even worse, if process number one attempts to, uh, to override the kernel itself, <coughs> right? Uh, so in this case, this is obviously some, something that we should not allow. And it's the job of the kernel to do this kind of protection, memory protection in this context, to protect uh, the system from buggy applications. If this application is buggy and is trying to access memory uh, that is not allocated to it, the memory that belongs to other user processes or to the kernel, then we should uh, protect the system from this. And how is this protect protection implemented? It's implemented uh, with hardware support. So when something like this happens with a mechanism that we will be studying in detail later in memory management, the hardware will, uh, there will be an exception will get generated and the hardware will trap 
to the operating system. How will that, will that happen? Because when an exception gets generated, that will invoke an interrupt service routine. You know, an exception is an interrupt. It's one kind of interrupt. <coughs> and for each interrupt, there is an interrupt service routine that services that interrupt. And that interrupt service routine belongs to the operating system. So whenever something wrong happens, if the hardware supports protection, it's going to give control to the operating system kernel. So it will just, you know, it will call the manager and the manager will resolve this uh, conflict. So in this case, if process number one is trying to access something that belongs to process number two, uh, what, what will the manager do in this case? It will just terminate process number one. So process number one is not a well-behaving citizen in the system and it's, uh, it will get terminated because it's trying to access resources that do not belong to it. So, and this, but this will protect the system from crashing. Now, I have programmed under an operating system that does not uh, allow this kind of, uh, does not support this kind of protection, which is DOS. So DOS is an operating system that I uh, programmed on uh, in my early career, and it did not provide protection. And if your application is trying to access a memory that does not belong to it, uh, that may lead to uh, you know, all kinds of bad behavior, like seeing all kinds of uh, uh, you know, garbage on the screen or even system crash. So on DOS, if you do something in C like integer star pointer, and then you do contents of pointer equals five, this may crash the whole system on DOS. Why? Could be rewriting a different piece of memory. Why? Not auto managing where you're. It just where you're it. it just puts it. It's just like oh, I'm gonna assign the pointer to this address. It doesn't actually check what's already at that address. Well, it's assigning it. It's pointer is not initialized, which right. means that it can be point any. It can point anywhere. Anywhere. So we are not initializing the pointer. We're not making it point to a certain a valid <coughs> memory address. So it's pointing to a random address, and that random address could be just the kernel itself, right? And if, it, if we are overwriting something in the kernel, when we do this, we write five at somewhere in the kernel, and we are overwriting the kernel code, and then the system crashes. And uh, in, in my you know, early career, when I was programming in C under DOS, uh, I was getting lots of crashes. Okay. I had to reboot the machine a lot. Uh, now, you know, with a protected, uh, all the, the modern operating systems that I'm, the, the modern general purpose operating systems that I'm aware of, they all offer protection and they do not allow this. But remember, you need hardware support for this. And the earlier versions of the uh, Intel processors did not, uh, did not uh, have this support for protection. So support for protection, remember, that when, when that exception gets generated, control is given to the kernel. And then the kernel can resolve the, the conflict by terminating the offending process. So, you know, nowadays, you know, uh, operating systems ship with many, many different uh, you know, pieces of software, which we call system programs. But some operating systems <coughs> even have, you know, programs that are not system programs, like, uh, uh, you know, games and uh, uh, calculators and, you know, applications like this that ship with the operating system. Clearly, these are not, uh, you know, these are not part of the kernel. These are not, these have nothing to do with the, uh, you know, with the main functionality of the operating system. So these are uh, things that you get as part of the package you know, that, that, that you are getting. But the essential part is the kernel, the one program that is always running, always, not always running, it's always, uh, uh, it's always in memory. In fact, one program running at all times on the computer, this is not strictly true, because we will define running at some point, and running means ha is, has the CPU. So in fact, 
I just noticed that this is not, that strictly this is not true. Uh, it's always loaded in memory. So what happens is, suppose that you have a single CPU. <coughs> when you have a single CPU, only one program can be running at any given point in time. It's just a single CPU. So initially, it's the kernel that is running. Then the kernel is going to give the CPU to some other process. So now, when process number one is executing on the CPU, process number one is running. The kernel is not running. It's, you know, the term running in this course means uh, running on the CPU, as the CPU. So when process number one is running, the kernel is not running, but it's active. It's loaded in memory. And it's waiting for, in fact, it's waiting for an interrupt to happen, as we will explain in detail in the next lecture. So in the next lecture, we will be explaining how all of these interrupts drive the operating system. Okay. Yeah. So by the way, what we will be discussing next lecture is going to be very fundamental and very important to understand how interrupts drive the operating system. So the kernel is always loaded in memory, but it's not always running on the CPU. In fact, it's desirable to minimize the time that the kernel spends on the CPU. We would like the CPU to be serving the user programs, not the kernel. We would like 99.999% of the CPU time to be given to application programs, not to the kernel. We would like to minimize kernel intervention. Okay, so it's, you know, the kernel is the manager, but that manager, uh, you know, manages and controls the system with minimal intervention. Okay, uh, so let's talk about the bootstrap. We have a couple of minutes. So the bootstrap program is a program that is in, in any, uh, any uh, uh, machine, any hardware. There is the bootstrap program that is stored in read-only memory or in the firmware. And it will be the very first program that will run when you boot the system. When you boot the system, the bootstrap program runs. And what does that bootstrap program do? It will do some initializations. It will initialize certain uh, things in the system. And then it will load the kernel. And once it loads the kernel, the kernel now is in control. And we will see next time how the kernel, <coughs> you know, what's the mechanism that the kernel will use to give the CPU to processes and then get it back. We will see that it will, the, the, the kernel has a mechanism for getting the CPU back after giving that to a process by setting up a timed interrupt. So there is a timed interrupt that the kernel will set up that will give the process, give the CPU to a process for a limited period of time, not for forever. That's how the kernel stays in control by setting a limit on the time that is given to each process on the CPU. 